So there are a couple kind of exits. I think that uh, the one that some people think are the IPO, the initial public offering, that is like going to the stock exchange. So that is like what Spotify did last year, um, the New York Stock Exchange, and that means that essentially they become a listed company. Um, that's one kind of exit. It's rather rare, honestly, because you have to be a super mature company, and as most stock exchanges, you need a, a very significant turnover to actually do that. The second exit, which is the one which is more common, is um, an acquisition by another company. So a bigger company wants to acquire you. And I would say there, there are two kinds of exit that are common. One is um, the pure, we acquire this company because it's a great company and we want to like do what they do. The other one, which is very uncommon in, in the Nordic, sadly, but rather common in markets where it's very high, hard to get talents, are uh, acqui-hires, so acquisition hires, acqui-hires, uh, which is that you want to acquire a company because you want to essentially just hire them. But you can't just hire them because they're running a company and these like eight people, they have got funding and everything, but you want to hire these eight people. So you acquire the company to get them to join the company. Sadly, it's a phenomenon which is rather new in Sweden. It doesn't happen that much in the Nordics in general. And I think it would be a big difference because it's hard for anybody from Creative and Doctor, Spotify, iSettle, to kind of anyone else to hire the best machine learning people, the best DevOps people, the best marketing people. So sometimes acquiring a small team that might be the one of the best teams, but haven't figured out their idea perfectly, might be a cheaper and better way. And also for those people, it might be the best career step for them. So I, I for me, getting Echo Hires to the Nordic scene would make a huge difference. So IPOs, normal acquisitions, Echo Hires are the three normal ones. My first company, The Astonishing Tribe, TAT, we were acquired by BlackBerry in 2010, um, and it was, it was a kind of a mix, actually, because it looked like the mid-kind of acquisition that they acquired the company, but it was so much that they wanted both our people, the talent, and our product. Um, but they threw away all of our customers. They were like, they acquired us and what we do, and we started the product from scratch again with them. So it was like a mix between a huge acquire hire of 180 people and a normal acquisition. But um, internally, it was very much seen as they wanted to culturally change. Um, that was like my that was the first exit I did. And then with my second company, Brisk, we did a very very small exit where we sold the company uh, for shares actually in uh, a U.S. company. So I would say that was uh, the fourth, maybe not mentioned category, which is a shitty exit uh, that might look like an exit in some more parts of the world, but it's not a real exit. It's just a way to not having to dismantle the company. Yeah, with TAT, like, we were not looking to sell. So the weird thing about that is that they, they approached us out of nowhere and said, we'd like to acquire the company. We actually started the whole conversation by saying, well, I don't think you do. Honestly, I don't think you know what we do because we're kind of an unacquirable beast. We were too many people. We were a lot of different locations. Um, in acquisitions, I think a lot of times you're after solving one problem. And we, TAT, we were kind of a, like, we were just like a mix of different things, different offices, different places. We had automotive customers, mobile customers. We were in Korea, we were in Taiwan, we were in, in Japan, we were in Chicago, we were in San Francisco, we were in Malmö, we were in Gothenburg. We were just, it just felt, you can't acquire us, it's not going to go well. But they were very persuasive. They told us, like, come to Canada, let's talk. And then when they, we came there, they gave us an offer saying, we want to acquire you for this amount. We said, well, okay, sure. That sounds crazy. And then we got on the plane and we got back to Sweden um, like the day after. They had sent us a formal letter saying this is what we would like to acquire you for. And that's when we felt this is probably the real deal. And then we had to decide do we want to proceed on this or should we just say no thank you. Uh, because of course it's a huge risk going into an acquisition. Because if we would say yes we would like to be acquired and the acquisition wouldn't go through, all like um, we might be very disappointed, the founders, if th that happens. That happens sometimes with founders. But a lot of times the employees might be really afraid because they might feel, okay, we're not actually trying to solve this problem. Maybe we're after getting sold. And then the other problem is, of course, our customers. They would feel, okay, so we can't buy this product anymore maybe because maybe they're going to be acquired by someone else. So going through an acquisition and, and failing to like, be acquired is sometimes a really, really big risk for the company. Um, so we had a long discussion if we actually should even try or we should just say no thank you right away and we really really like them uh, so we felt okay let's go let's let's try this i think that i think when you grow as a company 
I think that you get to a point when you're like if you look at your growth curve, whatever, like you're measuring whatever, like whatever company is measuring. And I don't think one should measure revenue, but like whatever. If you're trying to make sure that people buy weddings, or you're trying to make sure that people book tickets online, or you're trying to make sure that people take pictures or something, then you have that as your metric, and you see how that grows. And sometimes you get to a point where it starts to stall. Like you see that it doesn't grow as fast anymore. And then I, it's very common for companies to get to a point where you just grow not fast, you stop growing as fast. And when you get to those stall points, there, there are three ways of getting out of it. You just sweat and work, and maybe it works. You acquire something else, uh, or innovate something else to make it grow, or you become acquired. So I usually feel that as a company, if you get to a stall point, I think you have to decide, should you continue and just try, maybe for a year, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. Should you acquire something else, or think very differently, or should you be acquired? And I think that that's a good time to think about it. Before then, I don't think one should think about it that much. Grow as fast as you can, as much as you can, but suddenly when you stop growing as much, start thinking about how to grow faster. I really dislike that because I think that if you start a company and thinking who you're going to sell to, I think the problem is that it's a very big risk of optimizing for the wrong user. Because I think that I think that if you're starting the company thinking I'm going to sell to these people, I think it's for me it's the same problem as newspapers. Their customers are the readers. But the problem is the people who pay newspapers are advertisers. So the problem is newspapers they were fucked because they started optimizing for advertisers, which means that the readers don't like newspapers anymore. And I see that a lot of times with companies. They're trying to make themselves the best puzzle piece at Google or Oracle or Salesforce. And they're not really thinking that much about their customers because they want this strategic thing. And that means, of course, they're going to fail. Um, so I think it's, it's, I don't think one should do that. I think that when, when you grow and become bigger, I think that it's very important to look at your customers, your partners, and your suppliers, and the big players in the industry, and start to try to think about where we might like who would be the best partner? And mentally, I think the best way I think one should think about who should acquire you is I think that I usually start the exercise by thinking, who should we acquire? And if the answer is we need to acquire Google to grow faster, well, they will acquire us. Uh, but I think that that's the best way of thinking about it. So like if you look at the world and go, if we only own Spotify, because then they could send us, they, we could be a part of this, then maybe you should talk about Spotify with partnering. And maybe Spotify would say, well, we'd rather acquire you. But if you start thinking, oh, we'd be a piece in Spotify, but you don't think about we should acquire Spotify, so to say, I think the problem is then you don't need to really understand why they would want to have you. So I think the best way of figuring out who could possibly acquire you is thinking who should we acquire. And I think starting day zero with thinking, oh, maybe let's start a company together and acquire Spotify. It's like, what? Why do you want to do that? So I don't think, I think one should think about their users first and foremost, and when you think about your users, you have to think about how they would solve their problem otherwise, and then you have to think about the landscape of competitors and everything else, but I think that, I think one should only think about their users, not think about everything else. But it's very interesting to have two very successful people have a different view of Absolutely, it. Absolutely, yeah. Because you said that you tried to sell the company four years prior to when you sold oh, okay. it, uh, and didn't manage to, Yeah. Uh, and then had to start thinking, and that you wished from day one thought who wanted to sell it to. Yeah, I, I mean, it does make sense in one sense. I think that, I think it's one of those things where, I think that it's good to kind of think about it, but I think that if you're trying to plan for it or kind of optimize for it, I think you're doing it wrong. But I think it's one of those things. I think it's, I think that it's like, if you have, if you haven't thought about it at all, it's going to be very strange for you because you might realize suddenly that you might, so for example, if you don't think about what the landscape is of, of customers and partners and suppliers and big players in the market, the risk is that you will alienate some of these, like you will tell them to fuck off at conferences and stuff. And the problem is that then they will never acquire you because you're going to be the nasty people in the industry. So I think, of course, thinking about that is smart. To think about how does the big puzzle look and where does our piece, where does it lie? But I often find that, like when I, like I ran mergers and acquisition at BlackBerry. And when I met a company that wanted to be sold, we very much, we wanted to be bought, sorry. It was very rare that we bought them. Mm -hmm. But when we met a company where, uh, like, we randomly met the company, for example, who wanted to license technology for us, to us, 
and we realized we wanted that technology, then we often acquire them. So uh, most acquisitions don't happen by you pitching to a big company saying, we want to we want to we want to sell, we want to sell, we want to sell. Most company acquisitions happen by internally in the company, the big company. They wake up one day and realize, oh no, we have to grow by 50 more machine learning people by Christmas. That's going to be super hard. We need to hire one person every day. And then you realize, oh, I, that's never going to happen. We just need to acquire a team. So then create a, please, you turn around, create a list of machine learning companies with more than 20 employees that are in legal countries where we can operate or we have offices already uh, that, that aren't super successful, that haven't raised too much money. You get that list and then you just tell someone else, Check on all these and check on like if they're missing like patent discussions or anything shit that reason that we can't acquire them like litigations or anything. You get that list now. You have this list. Contact them and get a call with them and like are they smart? Now you have this list. Okay, get them on a meeting and see if we can acquire them. So that was how we were acquired by by BlackBerry. They just woke up one day and realized we need to fix our user interface problem. Go out and acquire the companies. That was it. And when I did acquisition for BlackBerry, it was exactly the same thing. We realized suddenly we're never going to solve this problem without acquiring this technology or acquiring this channel, sales channel, or acquiring these hires. Go out and fix that problem. Um, so actually, I think trying to sell oneself to a big company is kind of like being the desperate guy in, in the girls' pub. It's like people just go like, why are you doing it? We're having a girls' night. Just go away. Uh, but if you're invited by a friend, and you actually didn't want to go, but you're thinking, hey, I'm going to be like just hanging out with people. Then you're casually going to talk, and then suddenly people are like, hey, you're a nice person. Why are you single? And you're like, I don't know, Like, are you hitting on me? And that's when it happens, not when you're desperately staring people in the eyes. So what I take a bit from that is also just being market smart. Like, know your competitors, know what other players are there, and try yeah. to create the best product. That is absolutely it. I think that if you have created the best product, like you will just, you will win. Mm -hmm. I think that... Some of the most interesting acquisitions happen usually because the big company realizes that they have to acquire this company now because they're growing too fast. So eBay, for example, one of the more famous stories, eBay acquired PayPal because PayPal grew so fast that if PayPal would have continued to grow for a while, eBay realized that they wouldn't afford to acquire PayPal. They just looked and realized, oh shoot, if they continue with this pace, like they're going to be super, super expensive. So acquire them now before they, they, they become too big. And I think that's why I think that companies should just focus on improving their metrics and be, like growing faster and faster and faster. And because then you, your competitors, your partners, your suppliers, and the big players would just look at you and go, "We have to take these into account. They're they're doing something right." And of course, investors will do the same. They will be like, "These people come out of nowhere, and suddenly like everybody talks about them. But like, we should figure out what these guys are doing." That's how I think I'd rather do it myself as well because it feels more organic. Yeah, and I think that then you always know, I mean, the risk, I think the risk is, I think if you're, if you're putting your happiness uh, at, I will meet the right person in my life and, and get children, and like you're spending all of your time thinking about that, being unhappy when you're not, that means you're going to be, most of your time you'll be unhappy. But if you spend your life thinking, I'm going to be the person that's a nice person, and I'm going to do the nice things, and then suddenly you meet the nice person and, and like fall in love. Well, you know, it's more probable that you fight the right person if you're a nice person than if you go out and like every person you look who's not a potential date, you just like fuck off. Yeah. Then you're never going to meet the date because people are like, oh, you're the person that says fuck off to everybody. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that is super important to know is that the people who work in MA, they are, they're, um, when they approach a company, it can be two stages it can be complete curiosity. And they're not super interested in acquiring you. They just want to ask you some questions, maybe because they're looking at a similar company in the industry or something. Then it doesn't matter what you do. Like you, I, I'm always the nice guy. If they call me and they have questions about our industry and they're saying they might be interested, I, 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 don't, I don't talk to them. Like it doesn't matter. I'm, just, I'm always the nice guy. If they actually want to acquire you, they're very, very stressed. And you can see it because it's how quickly they want the next steps. So if you want to figure out if you're actually being acquired, it's how, how stressed is the other party and how, how fast is the process. So if you're in a discussion with a company and the company says, can you meet on Friday? Can you fly here next Tuesday? Can you do this? That means they're really looking to acquire you. If they're kind of asking questions and taking their time, they're not looking to acquire you. The biggest problem of being acquired is like it's a combination of being abducted and being uh, adopted. 
The tricky thing is like, you know, you come to this new family and this is your new family. You gotta love them. But the problem is, you're not one person. So you might be five people, you might be 50 people, you might be 500 people. So the problem is like, when you come to this new family, you have to redirect everybody's opinion right away that this is the new goal. And the tricky thing is that some of you might have been paid a lot of money, some of you might have bonuses if you achieve certain things, some of you might have super important plans in the previous company that you fought over, who now realize that now is the opportunity to get these plans through. So the problem is like the, the second the company realizes that it will be acquired, all the employees, some wants to leave immediately, some want to figure out that they now become the right title, some want to do this and that, so there's a lot of politics. The day after you're acquired, and the new people arrive who acquired you, everybody wants to talk to them, everybody wants to make sure that they're the ones that are like known for this and that. So I think that the period just like the week before almost, and like the three months before after, is a period that it's, it looked like an anthill that now all need to learn to walk in the, the same direction. And that's just super chaotic. And who used to be like your colleague and your best friend at the company might now consider themselves to be the person competing for the same position. So it's really, really complicated on a people matter to make sure that people still feel that, hey, we're a good family, we're doing the right thing, we love what we do, because 20% of the people will always be disappointed. 20% of the people will be super happy because they have a new opportunity to find to get the thing they wanted to do. And then, you know, 60% will be like, okay, some good, some bad things. But managing this is really, really hard. No, I think, I think that when you build a company, you should focus on solving the problem for your customers and growing as fast as you can. And, and you should always be nice to partners, suppliers, uh, the big players, the, like the customers, because I think that at the end of the day, some of these you might want to acquire, some of them you might want to partner with, some of them will be acquired, acquiring you. And I think that we always did that. Like We didn't think about who would acquire us. We thought about how to make sure that we were the best company in the world doing what we did and being nice to everybody, independently if they were even a competitor. Um, not because we wanted to be acquired, but because we just felt, why be an asshole? Life is just too short. So I think that's really my philosophy, and I think everybody should be trying to do that, because I find too many companies put out their elbows and try to be smart, and they're just being super stupid. Yeah, I think that the most important thing, if you make a lot of money, is to not change many things. <laughs> I think the best way of getting really, really unhappy is to try to change a lot of things. I think when you landed and, and like figured out that, okay, I haven't changed that much, I'm still the same person, now suddenly everybody believes that you know stuff, and like you knew just as much the day before you got acquired as the day after, maybe a bit more because you've been acquired, so you've been through the process once, but that's about it. I think the most important thing is understanding that you, you're not top of the world, you're not, you can't advise anybody because you've been acquired once. I think so many people, when they've been acquired or had a success, they go out there and they become like evangelists and, and demigods and they try to tell people. But if they've been acquired 10 times, they know everything, right? But if they've acquired once, yeah, they know something. So I think that go out there, be super humble, but help people. Because now you don't have to think about getting paid. You don't have to think about your equity and everything. You could just be nice and find new things to fall in love with and help people. Because that's probably the way also you're going like, to enjoy the, like, what's going to happen next. You might find a new company that you want to invest in, or might want to work for, or advise, or you might just enjoy hanging out with ambitious people without having to sleep bad at night. Thank you so much.